well-being at work is, is the topic. And actually, uh, it was Clara, right? So what she gave you guys, as far as the title is concerned, is what we're calling um, our central question. Mildly provocative, hopefully, but if you think about it for a second, can the workplace actually be a place where you leave healthier than when you arrive? I mean, who feels that way at 5 o'clock? Like, yeah, let's do it again. <laughs> I do not, no, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Like, I'm ready to do exactly what I just did all over again. No, we disconnect, we unplug. We try to anyway, right? By the way, how blurry are those lines nowadays? Or how bad is our work-life balance, perhaps? Um, so that's our central question. And by the way, I'm going to ask you that like at least five times throughout the presentation. So let's remember that one. If you remember nothing more, that's the one, OK? That's the one. So the title of this CEO is Wellbeing at Work. I just gave you our central question, OK? What I want to start with is talking about well-being and its importance. And I, I, what I don't want to do is give you guys too many cliche statistics, because we all know what those are, right? Like obesity. How bad, how bad a shape are we in, right? We eat too much, we don't walk around enough. I mean, it's, you know, 2.3 billion obese, obese people globally, right, by 2015. It's a pretty big number, right? Okay, now if we are statistics type of folks, we need numbers to feel good about whatever we're talking about or thinking about. Um, the favorite stat that I use around well-being and uh, perhaps kind of how upside down we are around our thinking, and I'm not, I'm going to make a lot of general statements and I'm going to oversimplify stuff, so I'm not pointing at any one person in particular. But um, it actually comes out of a book called Population Health, uh, Creating a Culture of Wellness. Okay? Really, really good book. Super difficult read. It's like yay thick. But I've, I take, I took, I've taken a couple of nuggets out of it that uh, I quite like a lot. Okay? The one that I like a lot is around healthcare sector costs. So how, how, how much do we spend in healthcare sector? How many? <laughs> A little or a lot? <laughs> I'll give you really obvious answers, right? A lot. The question is how much? The question is how much? So if I were to compare um, healthcare sector costs with uh, education, uh, world water supply, and um, energy conservation efforts. So that one might hit home for you guys around what we spend our time doing and how close we are to LEED or USGBC or all the things that we do to try and create that kind of uh, environmental sustainability. Okay, so let's compare those. So which one costs us the most? Which one sucks or drains the most out of the economy? Healthcare, Healthcare cost, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I currently it's at, uh, it's going off at I think 18% of our GDP gets annihilated based on healthcare sector costs. So 20% of the profit, you don't ever see, it just disappears, vanishes, based on how unhealthy we are. And we'll talk about how to define that in a minute. So what about education? Anybody surprised that that's number two? Yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, you, we don't spend anything on that. Or you constantly hear about how much, we need to, how much more we need to spend, invest, that kind of stuff. It's actually number two. However, eight times the amount, healthcare sector costs versus education costs. Okay, eight times. What's that? Misinvested? That's even scarier. So if we miss, <laughs> this is not even taking into consideration the misinvestment, right? And if we are, this number probably skyrockets, right? What about... Uh, World water supply. How about 87 times? So we spend, consume, in, our, in the healthcare sector costs 87 times than what we would spend in energy, or, uh, healthcare, or uh, world water supply. Here's the doozy. Energy conservation efforts. Anyone want to take a stab? 150. I like your bold move. What else? One million times. Not quite. <laughs> I love the optimist. It's like a gazillion, 830 times. That one blew me away. So think about that, right? Think about all the time that we spend trying to protect the environment. I'm not saying, hey, let's just forget that and let's just go, let's, let's go a totally different direction. Let's go rogue on the world. The answer is no, don't do that. But think about all the time we invest on, that, on energy conservation efforts and to know that we might want to spend 830 times more energy on well-being just to equal it out, just to create an equilibrium, okay? Pretty lopsided. So this is actually at the heart of my expectation for today, is that everybody walks out of here thinking as much about human sustainability as environmental sustainability. You guys with me? Are you equating well-being with healthcare? I am. I don't, I don't know if, I, 
it's hard to say direct. I mean, they're, they're obviously crossover. There's, there's connections. You know, it depends on how you define well-being. There's, it's really complicated. Um, I just know that healthcare costs is kind of that number that everyone goes, yeah, we're kind of messed up there. So um, connecting it, yes. But uh, how we connect it is kind of a trickier topic there. So it's not as, uh, not as simply to say yes or no. So, or the engineer in me wants to say, that depends. Yeah. Right? Just, sorry. <laughs> My background's in industrial engineering, and whenever I don't have the answer, I'm like, that depends. <laughs> or I'll say, what does the audience think? I'm not going to give you the answer. What do you guys think, right? <laughs> That's the sign of, a, of an eloquent presenter, right, is I don't answer anything. I let you guys answer it for me. So I'll do that just a couple of times, not, not a whole lot, OK? So these statistics are the ones that kind of blow me away, all right? The other one that I was surprised by was proactive versus reactive. So if you look at the amount of money that kind of disappears based on reacting or direct medical expenditure, right? Versus how much we currently invest on, uh, I want to say proactive or, um, uh, what do I want to say here? There's a different word to say. Prevention, preventative, thank you. Wow, Whew. my plants are working by the way. It only, it only cost me like 100 bucks each <laughs> and they are completing my sentences. This is good news. <laughs> uh, well, well worth the investment by the way. So uh, what, what do you think reactive to proactive? If I had, uh, if I had 20 bucks, no, 100 bucks. If I had 100 bucks, Right now, reactive versus proactive. How, many gets, how much gets taken away based on reacting? 95. Yeah, 19 to 1 is the ratio. 19 to 1. Now, does that mean that we need to shift the ratio? Yes. But here's the bad news. It's probably going to take further investment, right? We can't say, oh, we're not going to fix the broken people. We're just going to actually, there are some really like super nerdy experts on this topic that insist that we keep the healthy people healthy. Have you guys ever heard that? So there's a guy named D. Eddington at the University of Michigan. I'm not saying he doesn't care for sick people, right? Don't get me wrong. But he's like, look, they're, they're beyond saving. Like, if you just keep the healthy people healthy, we'll be okay. Like, we'll get through this, right? Which is bad news for a lot of us based on the statistics that we've been throwing around, right? Or the people that we know or whatever the case may be, right? So 19 to 1. So we're kind of lopsided there, okay? Uh, I already gave you the obesity number. But what does that mean from a medical expenditure standpoint? So if we're 2.3 billion obese adults by 2015 globally in this country, so let me go from global down to the US, what does that mean from a medical expenditure standpoint? 43% greater medical expenditure. Okay. Now what about, what about physical versus maybe a more diverse definition of well-being? So what about physical and mental? Which one's more important, mental well-being or physical well-being? I love it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, nice! <laughs> she can be taught. It's feasible. By the way, I'm so enjoying making fun of you right now because it looks like you have thick enough skin to handle this. Is this true? It is true. If you cry, I'll feel bad for like a minute or two. <laughs> so, so mental... That was so... I got a four-year-old, man. She tries to pull that... No, I'm kidding. No. I did just call you a four-year-old. This is bad news for us. Our relationship's not going to go much further than this, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I usually have to threaten the back row to sit in the front row because no one wants to sit in the front. So you guys are noble, man. This is good news. Um, so from a, me a physical versus mental comparison standpoint, if we look at people that have report high mental stress versus normal stress, whatever that is, what does that look like from a medical expenditure standpoint? How much higher percentage wise? So the, the physical one was 43% higher, right? What about the mental one? What does that look like? 50. So when people are like, oh, we got to stop the physical before the mental, you guys gave the right answer. They're interconnected, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I quite honestly can't pull them apart. The bad news is they're both, they're both, we're both in bad shape on that one. Okay? Now, the last stat that I actually kept in here um, that I quite like is around this phrase presenteeism. You guys ever heard this? They are coming for me in case you were wondering. <laughs> presenteeism. Now, what's, what's absenteeism? You're, you're just... You're at. <laughs> Ken, your optimism is intoxicating, just so you know. <laughs> the two words you've said so far, uh, well, the phrase, slacking off, and m you say misused or misdistributed or something like that. <laughs> Ken's my equalizer, in case you guys were wondering. And the name tags give away easy, because then I can call you by your first name, and then it just it becomes weird faster, right? <laughs> so absenteeism is you're just not there, right? You're just not there. Presenteeism is what? You're there, but... You're not checked. Yeah, you're checked out, right? Yeah, I, I use that phrase a lot. You're not, you're, not, you're not checked in or you're checked out, right? 
you are performing or you, at, you are at a, a mere pittance to 100%, right? Um, so the, <laughs> the word presenteeism, when you look at what's synonymous or most closely related, I, a lot of people say the word engagement. So if you're wondering like, right now, like, okay, like how am I ever going to topple this giant that we just set up, right? I just saw this video that gave me a tear and like, you just gave me all these like really negative statistics. We got Ken down here saying all this fun s s stuff down here. How am I supposed to do this, right? So just think about the time that you may spend or the impact you could have as it relates to engagement, all right? That'll get us through this session, hopefully, hopefully, okay? So relative to presenteeism, we know it costs a boatload. Uh oh, I need to turn this on first. There it is. We know it costs a boatload, and quite honestly, it impacts the workplace maybe even a little bit more than absenteeism. And no, what I'm not saying is you should just stay home and just call it a day, right? But a lot of impact towards productivity comes to people showing up at work and not being checked in. A ton, right? So maybe we can use that as kind of an underpinning for what this message might mean. Okay? Is everyone with me? Okay. Yeah. How do, you, how do you quantify presenteeism? You have to track absenteeism. <laughs> <laughs> you have to track why people are not there, for starters. But I thought, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but I thought you said that presenteeism was about, uh, about the amount of engagement. Yeah. I understand absenteeism. I mean, that they're here or they're not. Yeah. But then, I start. But it's the. It sounds like you're talking about the quality of their ability of being here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Productivity, right? Okay. Yeah, we're on the same page. So I, I tease you a little bit about the absenteeism because that's actually where Steelcase is at, is we can't even begin to figure out whether, you know, why people aren't there or are there or track. We can't track presenteeism because we don't track absenteeism. So I'm giving you kind of like the 12-step um, the the, the process, right? <laughs> How do you become less of an alcoholic, right? You got to start somewhere, okay? I said it, yeah. Now I'm the negative guy, right? You're like, whoa, this guy's messed up. <laughs> So step one is start tracking it so you know where people are if they're not there. So you can kind of rule those folks out, right, and kind of track that. And then presenteeism is actually, quite honestly, the best global metric for well-being. But um, that takes an extra level of metric, right? So um, you might want to check things like, uh, well, you can do usage stuff as well. Um, you can get to productivity based on health risk assessments a little bit too. I don't know if you guys have ever taken one of those. Right? Or if you let them pull some blood and then you fill out this form that asks you some things, you get maybe a discount on your insurance, right? Oh yeah, I got the uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> and if you have an organization that insists on offering a stick as opposed to a carrot, if you don't do that, what do you get? <coughs> Surcharge. You guys ever notice how it's the same thing minus a word, right? Carrots and sticks, right? So that's, uh, that's kind of my, my weak answer for that is it can, you can get to it subjectively right now fairly easily, but you have to track a few different things. And if you don't, good luck is, the, is quite, quite honestly the answer, okay? That's where we're stuck personally at Stillcase, okay? So if we all get like, hey, it's a big deal, what do we do? Why is it so hard? Why can't we just say, let's design for well-being? Or if, if you, go to a, you go to an executive and say, this is a really big deal. Have you seen how much we spend in healthcare? I want to look for more opportunities to engage people in their well-being. Why is it such a hard sell? Ooh, okay, because it takes investment. That's a good one. What else? Complex. What makes it complex? There's not just one factor that impacts it. Very true. Okay, so well-being is multifaceted. Absolutely true. What about individuals? If I gave everybody a piece of paper and asked you to write your definition of well-being, how many different definitions would we have? Everybody would be different. Well-being is a very individual thing. It's hard to get through. Engaged, absolutely. Well, we can buy their participation, can't we? That's actually what we're doing, right? We're, we're, buying, we're currently paying people off to participate, mm -hmm. right? You do this and this, we will not spank you tomorrow, <laughs> right? That's how we roll. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, absolutely, right? And then you have that carrot and stick model, right? It needs to happen, quite honestly, because how are you going to make people aware or participate? How are you going to get to engagement without those, three, without those first two, right? So it's kind of a necessary evil, but how do you sustain that, okay? That's where I see space fitting in, quite honestly. So if there's another thing to take away from this is I see space, physical space, as what I call an underutilized lever. Another opportunity for people to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go choose this. I'm going to go do this. That's going to have an impact on my well-being. Okay? 
Right now it's kind of like, hey, it's cool if you work out, but make sure it's at like 4 a.m. or like 9 p.m. Right? Mm -hmm. That gets to a cultural aspect piece to it. What if you could leverage time at work? Nifty concept, right? I don't just mean like you make a, uh, a roller rink or a skating rink around a floor or a walking track or whatever the case may be. Great idea, because that's actually quite fun, right? Or you set up a foosball table that people are scared to use because HR hasn't anointed the program or whatever. You're, you're, getting, you're getting into some of my conversations, by the way, right? But the bottom line is, is that well-being is a very individualized thing. So if you think about the individual, and you think, well, let me ask you guys this. Uh, what's the cliche answer for um, uh, an organization's most valuable asset is? <laughs> right? Everyone knows what the right answer is, but does anybody believe that we truly pay that off? Yeah, we're short in a lot of ways, right? I told you I was going to oversimplify and exaggerate, and I'm a drama queen. You guys have figured that out, right? What's that? Why did it get paid off in a bottom line way in the way we offshore? Oh. Even though those are people's <laughs> <laughs> they're just lesser humans, but they're people. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> Perhaps Le less less demand or less um, less expectation or something. Yeah. So you. Yeah, you can calibrate that way. Um, and um, and in terms of using computers and stuff like that. Yeah. You. So that's, it's kind of funny you say that, because when you said computers, I'm thinking, oh man, we're going to go to like designing the human out of the experience, right? Like, um, so that's a whole nother conversation, right? It's like, hey, do, are humans still valuable kind of thing, right? Um, a lot of organizations that I've talked to are willing to go to like, well, we can animate a lot of this, or we can, we can automate a lot of this out, or a lot, the human out or whatever, and it sounds really bad when they say that, but you know, they're looking at it from a cost standpoint, right? Because that machine doesn't cost them money until it breaks, or they keep it up on maintenance, and that's part of the contract, and just... Correct, yeah, so they pass the buck. Yeah. They never do that, <laughs> never do that. But uh, it's a good, it's actually a good conversation to, to think about, right? Is like, how does that impact or how, how much are people valued, okay? <coughs> so in the interest of people caring about the individual and then going, going back to physical space, what was our central question again? I told you I'd ask it. Can the workplace make you feel better or better? Be Love the paraphrase. Do you feel better? Right. <laughs> 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 Say that again. Mm. We'll get there. Hold off on that for one second, okay? So the central question was this, right? Can the workplace actually be a place where you leave healthier when you arrive? Everyone laughed when I said, can you? Because you know that you leave at five and you're drained, right? Or four or seven or eight or nine or whatever that looks like. Right? Overworked, underpaid, bad work-life balance. It's all in there, right? It's all in there. But what if we could leverage time at work, right? What would that look like? Before we get to physical space and what that might look like and giving frameworks and, and positive vibes, let's first talk about defining well-being. What do you guys think of when you hear the word well-being? What do you associate with that word? Balance. Ooh, comfort. Like, balance? Yeah. <laughs> balance between work, play, did you say play? Sure. I love it. Balance. Play is actually a really cool word to use. Balance. I love it. What else? Feel good. Happiness. Ooh, who said happiness? Oh, I wish I had like a lottery card to give you or something like that. <laughs> so. <laughs> I like it. Happiness is the most commonly associated word when I've done this. And I've done this like a couple hundred times. So like happiness. You guys ever seen Zappos? You guys know who Zappos is? Yeah. yeah, they have a lot of my money. And I give them my money and then shoes show up, right? <laughs> and they show up in like six minutes. It's like, here are your shoes. If you, guys ever, if you guys have not called Zappos, actually I should do that on speaker, right? It's like, hey, thanks for calling Zappos. One for sales, two for the joke of the day. No joke. It's actually number five for joke of the day, if you must know. So, and you guys probably can figure out. I talked to a sales rep and asked them what the joke of the day was, and they didn't know. And they were embarrassed. Hmm. And then I said, I want shoes for free. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> so the reason why I bring up Zappos is that they're, they literally, it's like happiness and culture are like one. Right? You would probably die twice if you saw it because the ivy in that place, it's like a forest inside because they like have no uh, protocols over that. But I'll tell you what, that is the happiest place on earth outside of Disney World. 
right? Outside, outside of where, what's that? Trader Joe's. And Trader Joe's, actually no. Trader Joe's. So and I, I'm a trade. Well, you guys are bringing up these great companies, right? <laughs> Trader Joe's is a cool place. Both to shop, in my opinion, and then corporate space as well. Yeah, good call. So you guys can imagine these corporate spaces that are like, that's cool. I wish I could have some of that, or I wish I could pull some of that off, right? Why not? Okay, what else? I'm gonna put synergy down. I love it. Some of the parts is greater than each individual, that kind of stuff. I love that. I've not heard that word once in any time I've asked that, but I love it. What else? Conflict? Oh no. What do you mean by conflict? Like, um, is that why I try to make fun of people? I'm kidding. Okay. So it reminds me of, uh, so I'm reading a book right now called Good, you guys ever read uh, uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins? So his follow-up to that is uh, Great by Choice. I don't know if you guys have read this. Chapter seven is on luck. And actually you get as much from leveraging good luck as you do from learning from bad luck. So when you said conflict, that's what, I, that, that's what it reminded me of. What else, guys? Having the company that you work for care as much for you as a person as they want you to care respect. about their company. Ooh. Yeah. Mutual respect. I am going to put sense of purpose down. Yes, I'm, I, am, I am loading this with uh, content for my next slide. I am absolutely stacking the deck in my favor, in case you guys are wondering. <laughs> Honesty is the best policy. <laughs> <laughs> what else? You want royalties, don't you? I saw that look in your eye like, ooh, he likes this one. Let me talk this one up a little bit and then slip my business card and say, it's going to cost you. What's that? Influence. Influence. Like you have a say? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Influence. Control. Ooh, I like that. Ooh, respect. See, now we're on fire. <laughs> And I write poorly as I get lower, just so you guys know. Influence, control. There was one other thing you guys said over here. Oh, and get, uh, empowerment. I love that. All right, so let me stop for a second and ask you guys a different question. All right? Take this, this stuff, right? So now that we're all kind of focused in on what the heck we associate with well-being, I want you all to imagine that you are the uh, human resources strategist for a well-being program, either for an organization that you work for currently or one that you're consulting with, OK? I need you guys to give me three to five pillars or dimensions or how do we define well-being for an organization? Integrity. Inte I, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna shorten it to comfort, all right? And actually, I tell you what, this one gets to a lot of times uh, a physical dimension, right? Yeah. Physical, right? What else? Choices of where to work. Choices of where to work. Would that be a dimension or would that be like a product of a dimension? That's like, for that, I, see that, I see that one as like a huge deal. Actually, I mean, I'm gonna put it over because I don't wanna forget about it. But let's go a little bit higher level. Like for example, you guys know the flight, um, uh, core values, right? Mm -hmm. Think of this as a core value sheet, right? Honesty. Ooh. Well, that's that's integrity. Why you guys gotta call me out like that, man? <laughs> <laughs> Did you read the bio? It said Kevin's a nerd and don't call him out, otherwise he gets mad. Trust, Trust okay. Can I put that one up here? Come on, guys, give me something. All right. I love it. He's like, you messed up, man. Like, you did something over here that messed me up over here. I'm messing with his chi. Hard work? Ooh. Yeah, let's go a little bit. Let's go a little higher here. Yeah, All right. Commitment. Ooh. Flexibility. Oh, you guys are killing me here. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason why I take people through this exercise is because we've tried to look really hard at credible well-being models, mm -hmm. right? What do mo what what represents the population? What do people react to, right? From a well-being dimension or program element standpoint. So we took that model, the RATH model, which was financial, community, spiritual, physical, and uh, social. I think that was it. Where's the mental? I think physical and mental they put together. Okay, similar to what's down here. There's another model that I quite like. It's actually a, ha a happiness model. It's built by a company called NEF, the National Economic Foundation. 
There's a guy named Nick Marks that runs that. And he's cool. Yeah, he's cool. Seems cool. Met him once. Okay? So again, what we try to do is put like all the credible well-being models in a blender and kind of spin it around, right? These are the ones that we come up with. Now, I am not saying that you need to walk out of here and like chant these like a mantra. What I'm saying is that this is a perspective on the fact that well-being is holistic, right? And again, to start to maybe define it a little bit more so that maybe one day we can start looking at physical space and actually measuring it, right? Because how do you measure it if you don't define it, okay? So again, not to say that you've got to rule by this and this alone, but again, think about how space can pay this off. I'm sold on two out of the five today. I'm sold on physical mental health and connection to others. I think there is links, unequivocal links to all these. I just don't have the empirical data to tell you that it is. Okay? So what I don't want to do is oversell you on something. I've already done that with you twice. <laughs> Usually I'm waiting for a response. You're like, oh yeah, you did. You did that twice. <laughs> so what have we done so far? Before we go any further, we talked about how big of a deal well-being was. What was our stat? What was our stat on energy conservation efforts compared to well-being uh, healthcare sector costs? 830 times, right? It's a big deal. Why is it so hard? Because well-being is about the individual, right? Why aren't we successful at engaging people? Because we're paying them off to participate and we're stopping. <laughs> so let's look at things that we can pull, levers that we can use, physical space perhaps, right? To keep them engaged. How do we define well-being? This is perhaps one way. Okay, and you guys might have a different sense of what that looks like, but again, just to get your minds honed or focused on a lens of well-being. That's where I want to be right now. Are you guys with me? If not, we're going to start over. There's the threat. There's the threat. Uh, see, I <laughs> it's so funny. People are like this. They're like, yeah, no, I'm with you. No, 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 don't, don't go backwards. No, 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 forward, forward. No, go forward. <laughs> So let's talk about space and kind of what we've observed as far as like kind of train wreck status. Okay, like what you see now. What about tension? Anybody ever get tense? Outside of me being like in your personal bubble. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Come on, man. He's like, do it. <laughs> I, actually, your eyes told me to do it. That was weird. <laughs> Anybody ever get tense in the workplace? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Who's the most tense here? The dude on the phone. Yeah. yeah. I, you know what? Hey. I've got Ken hooked. He just said the dude on the phone. It only took me 10 dudes before he started taking that word and I love that. Yeah. Yes, I've just assumed that you never use that word except when you hear it 10 times. So the guy on the phone, who's vo who votes for the guy on the phone in the middle? Yeah, it gets the most votes. Who else? Why? What's her deal? Right, yeah. It's that kind of, excuse the expression, going postal kind of scenario, right? It's like she's just all pent up, right? I get a lot of that. Who else? Oh, wow, I've never gotten this before. Okay, wait, this guy? Yeah. Because he looks, what, offensive? <laughs> he's, all, he's all up in her business, right? I love this, man. Hey, your therapy session begins after this, right? So, but I'm with you, right? So what about the people on the right? No, they're collaborating. They're respectfully collaborating. Who buys that? Seriously, honestly, right? No, they're like, hey, you didn't give us a space to do what we need to do, so guess what? We're bringing it out here, right? So most people either vote for that guy in the middle because he's getting yelled at. Yeah. He's being flanked, right? But then <laughs> the most common is this guy's struggling in the middle most, and the people over here are being, quite honestly, disrespectful, perhaps. So again, tension. Especially when we're, hey, by the way, especially when we're talking about standardization, right? One size fits all, give everybody one thing. Doesn't always work. What about uh, diversity of worker is what I call this one. So essentially, this gal walks through, and she wants to sit maybe at a cafe booth, but can't. So she kind of just does this, I'm going to sit over here like this, like in my little broom closet. Like I'm going to choose this one because that's the only one I kind of have left. Okay? And then when does she move? When does she decide to move? I can't feel my legs, so I guess it's time. How often does that happen? You're in the zone, right? That's the ultimate rationale, right? I'm in the zone. I now have to eat my Tupperware lunch at my desk, and I'm not going to stop until I can't feel my hands. Let's do this. <laughs> no, you don't consciously say this, but it happens, right? It happens. What about uh, compromises based on technology? So this one I love. Actually, my favorite picture of this one is where there's like four chairs in like an enclave or a little area, and one of the chairs has a, a laptop on it. Yeah. It's like, who invited laptop? 
What do you think? Who's going to run this thing? You know, it's like you're like having a, it's crazy. It's an absolute afterthought. But yet, how much of our world revolves around technology? Right? Evolving technology, smaller technology, whatever the case may be. Okay? How about this one? Now, this is a great example of, in my opinion, of you don't know what you don't know. So this is the guy that sits here for maybe for more access to outside lighting. Who knows? But then doesn't get up until it's like, you know what? I can't feel my butt. <laughs> if I knew you guys better, I would have said ass, but I don't. <laughs> But, right? They're like, I can't feel it. I better move around or get my third cup of coffee or whatever that looks like, right? You don't know what you don't know. We work in unhealthy ways and don't realize it until you're reacting to it. How about no time? So you guys did laugh when I brought up the whole workout at 4 a.m. or 9 p.m.? Yeah. Yeah, so like the, the wellness program gets launched. And it's like, if you need a break, you take a break. And then like you get up. What would happen if you guys slung your gym bag over your shoulder at 1.30 and walked out? Where are they going? <laughs> You think you're better than me? And then you turn into that guy who's all pent up, you know, going, right? They usually don't get that confrontational, but they talk about you, right? They talk about you. Imagine a culture in which that didn't happen, right? Or you built it into the workday or whatever that looks like. I'm leaving things open-ended for you guys, okay? How about connecting is just hard to do? This one reminds me of a phrase I call presence disparity, okay? So I actually uh, travel about 200 days a year. I cover North America, which is a blast. Uh, there's a little bit of sarcasm in there. And uh, I, I, I do interact with a couple of different steering committees, and I'm almost never there in person. So I'm the guy, like, on the middle of the, bo like, the box with the speaker on it. I'm that guy. Your laptop. Yeah. <laughs> laptop guy. Thank you for uh, minimizing my potential impact on the world. I appreciate that. My sense of purpose is now at one out of a thousand. Yeah. It has been diminished, absolutely. But every time you guys laugh, I dig that about this group, by the way. So you're the guy in the speaker in the middle of, I mean, how disconnected do you feel? I'm your t Can't hear, and then I, what I do is I have to introduce myself every time I want to say something. Yeah. Hi, it's Kevin again. <laughs> how are you? Like, I mean, and then I have to like, dummy, then I have to like put on the nice voice too, right? Hello. It's, right, it's like, can I, can I say something? And then at the end of the call, they all give me stuff to do. And then I don't know what they're saying. And then I have to email the team afterwards and say, hey, can somebody bullet it out or send me the minutes? Because I don't know what I just signed up for. That's the epitome of presence disparity, right? Or you're on a laptop, or you're on Skype and the bandwidth is horrible, whatever the case is, right? Spaces aren't doing us any favor in a lot of cases, right? Or we misassess how important this may be, okay? What about the emotional need to connect? No one said emotional over here, but think about that for a minute. So we, we talked, I had a chance to talk to a couple of people about, about mobility strategies or how people are going to their home office or whatever the case may be, right? And then you go back to the office and you're expected to be like, like one with the office. You ever done that? You go down, even if it's like a free address space, right? It's like a hoteling space and everyone knows it. You sit down and they're like, do you know who normally sits there? It's like, are you serious right now? You're completely emotionally disconnected. It happens to me a lot. Now, I feel very fortunate that we talk about this stuff a lot, so it's kind of like we, we get it in most cases, but it doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't. Or you create a space that's designed for like a free address environment, or you can kinda, you're supposed to be able to come up and not schedule it, if you will, and there's like a post-it note with someone's name on it, and they're like, they put it on there somewhere, right? Or they put all their crap on it. They're like, no one's gonna move all this stuff, right? I'm gonna disappear for five hours, but no one's bold enough to like just transplant it to the next place. You take it over, right? So those are the observations. What are we gonna do about it? <laughs> what are we gonna do about it? Cry, run, those are all very legitimate reactions, right? But again, think about, what's that? Retire. <laughs> Not in the cards for me. Not in the cards for me. Even though I'm losing my hair, I still got a few years left, all right? Don't, that, seriously, that was one of those, hey, don't laugh at that, right? <laughs> I mean, I heard a, that's what I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> that's what that one meant to me. I, I, but you guys ever do that? The sound somebody makes, you're like, I wonder what he meant by that. And then you like put together the words and like, that wasn't good at all, right? <laughs> so let's talk about what we're gonna do about it, okay? So we, I've put a framework together and again, I'm not insisting we choke this down and say this is the rule. I'm just saying that based on all the observations, all the ethnography, all the, all, the, all the conversations and interviews that I've had, this seems to work, okay? This seems to work. So who said choice earlier? I think you did, yes, you did. So choice and control is kind of at the hub, right? It's kind of the umbrella, choice and control. Now, as an ergonomist, the word, choi the, the word choice makes me really nervous because people choose things and what? 
don't know what they don't know, right? And then they come to you and say, hey, my back hurts. And you're like, really, what's going on? Well, um, it's like a stabbing pain, yeah? <laughs> and you're like, okay, how long has this been going on? What do they tell you? <laughs> like 34 years. <laughs> I'm finally to the point where I can't take it anymore. <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh, the walking wounded, here they are. It happens a ton, does it not? Has anybody been uncomfortable and didn't say anything about it? Or like they put a post-it note on their steering wheel and said, remind me to talk to HR in the morning about my discomfort in my back. No one does that. It's like, hey, I can't exist anymore. I better go talk to somebody, right? So choice makes me nervous. I'd like to, th I use the phrase prescriptive choice. I'd like to think we could do a little bit better or be a little bit more intuitive perhaps that people will actually go places and hang out places for the time that we would like them to hang out there. Okay, you're like, this guy's like a control freak. To an extent, yes, because I don't want people to get hurt. Okay, so what about cultural context? We brought that one up a lot, right? It's basically what's gonna fly at your organization. Right, so I brought up Google the other day. I don't know if you guys saw the MSNBC, uh, the, the Google, the, they had Ratcliffe on, he walked them through space, and they had nap pods. You guys see nap pods? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially like a lounge that's kind of kicked up and the feet are elevated and they've got this shroud over top of you. You kind of crawl in and it's literally like right here. Like not off into the corner, like in a little cubby somewhere. There's no door. It's a nap pod. So there's a cultural context. Right? I was giving this presentation in Houston and they're like, um, yeah, no, it would never work. <laughs> Some of the stuff you talked about would never work. Find out what would work or find a first step and we'll give you a couple. Okay, that's where the palettes come in. Palette of place, posture, and presence. So when I say place, I mean you essentially have choice and control, or you're empowered. Bring out those other words, right? Empowered, or you kind of have control over um, how and where you get work done. An example might look like this. This guy's got a ton of choice. Stand up, sit down, go over here, meet, oh, go back. Go over here, we've got people kind of meeting over here in kind of a semi-formal deal where they can have a piece of pizza and get some work done at the same time. We've got this area back here, it's called the library, no one speaks. Again, if you need heads down time, privacy, you go back there. So deliberate attempts at that choice and control. Now, here's what I'm gonna, one thing I want you guys to leave with here. I, I'm not gonna put like Olympic rings in the corner or like waterfalls and be like, oh, sit by the waterfall for a while. A lot of people think I'm gonna, we're gonna go there. Like, how crazy can we get? Nap pods. For a lot of organizations, that's crazy, okay? The reason why we're not going there is because I think the step, step one is taking all the things that you associate with well-being, that lens, and layer it over, over the top of spaces you design today. And I'm just, I'm, I, I won't say guarantee, but I'm guessing you're missing a few things. I know I was. When I looked at it, I'm like, oh my gosh, we completely dissed this one or that one. Okay, that's the goal, is to walk out of here, look at space today, layer over that well-being lens that we focused on the entire session on, and say, am I doing enough? Am I doing enough, okay? Benching, that's also getting more popular, but then you've got people that are like, hey, these two gals, they're kind of talking up a storm, where do I go? Do I have an adjacency to go to, right? Do I have control, can I go someplace? Palette of posture, we call it sit, stand, walk. It's the best way I can articulate that. When I say walk, what do you think I mean by that? Yes, get up and take a break. You guys ever had walking meetings? It's kind of a cool one, right? Sometimes the culture is not ready for it, so you have to go and pay off an executive to do it, and then everyone follows, right? There are tricks that work, yes. So what about this one? When some people say, where do I start? I just renovated this space. I just spent an arm and a leg on this space. How about putting a standing table, offering no seating, so people can informally connect, and maybe at the end of a eight pack or something like that, right? Or what about taking a conference room? It's usually, by the way, gettable. It's bad when you go up to a person's space, you're like, on Monday, we're gonna reinvent this space. <laughs> Trust me. That's a scary thought, first of all, right? For like an iSpace, for an individual space. What if you take a conference room and gave them only tables, took away the chairs, right? Or built a walking track somewhere, deliberately. So people are like, wow, they did it intentionally. I'm gonna now use this, right? This must be okay, right? That's sometimes how you get that. Now what about palette of presence? I talk about this one a lot because of that presence disparity, because of how much virtual traffic is kind of taking over. By the way, when you do Skype, like how's the experience? <laughs> I love Skype, cool organization, bandwidth sometimes is an issue. How many chins do you have? You're like 12, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, like what happened to you, right? Or you have to hold back talking to the person like, what just went down, right? Like, I wanna, but you don't do that, right? Because you're, you're having a conversation, but it affects the experience. You're self-conscious, they're thinking you're weird, it's a bad deal, right? They're thinking you're weird, right? <laughs> You've been there, you're like, I look okay, like what about here? And like, what about this, right? <laughs> or then you look like what's behind you and you're like, oh no, that's behind me? My Justin Bieber poster is up? Oh, busted, right? But again, think about how space needs to look to control the experience. Okay, this is one example. The reason why I like this picture also is it layers over top, palette of presence, and what that needs to look like to have a experience similar to what would happen if you were in person with the per with in person. What's going on here? A deliberate, a deliberate attempt to work in palette of posture. So this is where these things start to layer over top. So again, my job today was to hopefully, well, ask you this question. Many of you might be thinking, no, yeah. right, no. Okay, well-being is a big deal. It's really tough because it's all about the individual. We talked about defining well-being. We showed you observations. We talked about designing it. You guys can take the test now, right? You guys can ace the test. What was the central question? I got a lot of participation there, which I'm digging. So can the workplace actually be a place where we live healthier than when we arrive? You have to probably embrace it. Right on. <laughs> amen. Hey, this is crazy. This has turned amen. spiritual on me, right? Amen. Kenneth said amen. amen. That just went weird. I'll tell you what, guys. Thank you so much. You're laughing. This is good news. <laughs> Healing power of laughter. Don't forget about it. And yes, the Joker said that in the first Batman with Michael Keaton. I did not originate that st statement either. Clara, thank you so much. Wendy Hellers from Steelcase. Thank you guys for being here. And... Um,